to be a British horn player, as we both are, is to kind of play, to listen and understand the instrument under his magnificent aura that he left us with his really quite remarkable career. Dennis Brain was unique. He was the, the player who really took the horn out of the orchestra context into being a solo instrument. And he was world famous because of that and his phenomenal technique and modesty and generally a very lovely man Hello Ben. Good afternoon Tony. This is lovely to be here in, in this beautiful building of St Mary's Church in Ashwell and we're here to launch the album project uh, that you've been recording. I think it's lovely that uh, we can be here together because this church for me in particular has meant a great deal. My family moved here in 1953 because my father was offered the living here as the rector of the village and um, uh, we, my three older brothers and myself and uh, used to sing in the church choir just down there, and my mother played the organ. So we, I come from a very musical family, and um, later when I started playing the horn, although we lived in the huge rectory next door, and my brothers and my family in general couldn't really stand my playing, um, and um, the noise, I think, I hope. And anyway, I used to come in here and do my practice and blow the roof off and have a great time. Well, yeah, I mean, likewise, we've been in Ashwa now for 15 years, and I don't get turfed out to St Mary's here, but the other church down the road. So a similar story, an experience of saving our parents and siblings' ears. <laughs> but yeah, I'm delighted to be here in the church to, to launch this album, which is a very special one to me, very special one to you, I understand. Yes. Um, Dennis Brain played a, a huge influence in all of our lives as horn players. Indeed. So I, I'm really thrilled um, to have this opportunity from the Guild of Horn Players. What have you entitled it? What's it called? So the title of the album is Legacy, a tribute to Dennis Brain. The idea being, of course, that 2021, the 17th of May 2021, is his centenary. Um, and to be a horn player, especially to be a British horn player, as we both are, is to kind of play, to listen and understand the instrument under his magnificent aura that he left us with his really quite remarkable career. And in putting together this programme, I wanted to encapsulate the legacy that he left. Um, so as such, we have two pieces by composers he worked with. Uh, Sir Malcolm Arnold and Benjamin Britten. Two pieces that were written in his memory, the Francis Poulenc Elegy for horn and piano, and a rather quirky fanfare salute to Dennis Brain by Sir Peter Maxwell Davis, which was written for the 50th anniversary of his death. And as we both know, as many people will know watching this, Dennis Brain was an incredible pioneer for the horn as a solo instrument, um, especially with regards to new music. And in this vein, along with the Guild of Horn Players, we commissioned two marvellous new works by Roxana Punufnik and Hugh Watkins. Sounds like an amazing variety and very interesting to listen to. So Ben, let's talk about the music, shall we? Um, you're starting off with Malcolm Arnold's music. Um, I gather that it, uh, it's the fantasy. Yes, absolutely. Right. Um, it's worth mentioning, of course, that the fantasy was written in 1966, so impossible to have been written for Dennis Brain, but they had a wonderful collaboration, uh, a wonderful friendship, which I believe was formed in the London Philharmonic Orchestra when Malcolm Arnold was a trumpet player, first trumpet. Principal trumpet, yes. First trumpet. Um, and he wrote his second horn concerto for Dennis Brain, another wonderful work. And I must say, it warms me inside to know that in, even Dennis Brain took the score to him and told him that <laughs> some parts were too difficult and he must modify it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this um, Malcolm Arnold fantasy for solo horn is a short work. Um, it's a very simple ternary form that contrasts two very energetic, lively, virtuosic sections with a really quite gorgeous, um, ethereal, melodic middle section. And I really think that it shows how remarkable Malcolm Arnold was as a melodist. Um, it's also interesting to note that um, Malcolm Arnold uh, first knew Dennis in, during the war 
when, when Dennis was in the RAF, Malcolm Arnold was still playing the trumpet then, but they did strike up this very warm uh, relationship, the friendship. And I think they, there's a story that they once recorded something and Malcolm Arnold was giggling so much they eventually had to stand back to back in the studio in the days of when there were no retakes, you know, um, and just to get it in, in, in the can because they were just giggling so much. Uh, outrageous, really. <laughs> <laughs> but so let's hear some of the Malcolm, Malcolm Arnold fantasy now, shall we? We're going to talk about the Canticle 3 now by Benjamin Britten. Absolutely. Well, as you say, this is Canticle number 3, and, and that's number 3 or 5 that Benjamin Britten wrote for various small chamber ensembles. And this third Canticle was premiered at the Wigmore Hall in 1953 with Dennis Brain playing the horn, with Benjamin Britten on the piano and Peter Pears as the tenor. And the connection actually is quite extraordinary with this Canticle, with other music on the album, with Dennis Brain, with Britten. It, it's all kind of a it merges into one really quite intricate web of, of connections. The first being that in the same program, in memory of Noel Mutant Wood at Wigmore Hall, there were two pieces um, premiered by Britain and Brain by Alan Bush, another English composer. And it's actually part of our plans with the Guild of Horn Players and Three Worlds Records to record these two previously unknown works later on this year.
the music itself um, of the Britain has a really interesting and poignant connection to both Malcolm Arnold and Francis Poulenc. Of course, both were writing in the middle of the 20th century, a time where, especially in Germany and Darmstadt, there was a big trend of serialism that all three composers rejected. But what's very interesting about the Britain and the Poulenc, for example, is that in both introductions, the composer introduces all 12 tones of the chromatic scale without any repetitions, which is the essence of really? serialism. So really wow. interesting connections there. Back to the Britain, the piece calls for a tenor as well as the piano. And it was a huge joy to be joined by James Gilchrist and Hugh Watkins for this yeah. recording. Um, th the recording itself acted as a catalyst for future collaborations with both artists. I've worked with Hugh a lot now since the recording back in August, and I will be playing the Britain Serenade with James this July. So a really nice exploration of more music with both of them. Well, I first met Hugh Watkins' music through his horn trio, mm -hmm. which was written for Richard Watkins, and I performed it a few times last year and had a few conversations with, with Hugh about, you know, just pragmatically how to play certain things, his ideas. And so when I had the opportunity to commission him, it was an extremely exciting thing for me because it was really my first major commission of a major composer. Mm. And so when the score arrived in the post, I, I really had no idea what to expect, as you don't. Um, but it, it turned out to be an extremely poignant and special work. He titles it Lament, and given the nature of this album, it's easily conceivable that one could imagine it as a lament for Dennis Brain. Yeah. The music was written um, in July of 2020, four or five months after this coronavirus pandemic began. And it's a very interesting um, example of how musical material and the composer's life are connected. And he, of course, had the Poulenc Elegy in mind because I told him what the album was about. Yeah. And somehow, through the lament, he's managed to encapsulate loss for all things, not just for one particular case. And I think that that's a really remarkable thing to, to capture in music. And the work itself, therefore, again, is framed by two really beautiful, flowing, melodic passages. And, and in the centre of this, you really have two very anguished, uh, climactic moments at the top of the horn's range. Um, and, and you really feel like you do in the Poulenc Elegy, this anguish. Um, pain. Pain, pain, exactly, mm, painful yeah. music. And uh, I, it was an incredible honour to explore this with him playing the piano. Gosh, wonderful.
So Ben, the next work on the album is a work written by the young British composer Roxana Ponufnik. Can you elaborate on, tell us about the work and uh, how it came about and your relationship with her, the friendship you have? Absolutely. Well, this whole album is about connections, personal connections, musical connections. And there's a very nice connection here between myself and Roxana because I began the horn at the age of nine as a result of a lung condition I developed, bronchiectasis. And to this day, she remains the only person on planet Earth that I know personally with the same condition. So by the magic of social media, we've actually been in touch over the last five or six years, sharing advice on which vitamins and all that nonsense to take. And when I had the opportunity to get something written for this album, I immediately approached her because I was a huge fan of a trombone piece that she had sent me a few years ago. And what she has done is a really remarkable transcription slash arrangement of three songs that she had. And she's put these um, for horn and piano, uh, specifically for this album, and we are about to hear a full performance of that now.
So Tony, on the way here, you showed me this remarkable program, this piece of history that you have in your collection. Perhaps you could explain a, a little bit about it and talk about Dennis Brain, what he did for the horn, his legacy. It's a privilege to do that, Bern. Yes, thank you. Um, Dennis Brain was unique. He was the, the player who really took the horn out of the orchestra context into being a solo instrument. And he was world famous because of that and his phenomenal technique and modesty and general, generally a very lovely man. I sadly didn't know him. I didn't start playing the horn until two years after he died. But I mean, I have been told by many, many uh, older horn players that he was a joy to work with. And he came from a, an incredible legacy really with his family. His father, um, uncle and grandfather were all very distinguished horn players. Um, and um, uh, Dennis Brain just, he, uh, he really got that sound into his head of the, the, old, uh, the old French horn in F. We don't use those anymore, except the people who are interested in original instrument uh, music. Uh, but we play on modern instruments. And, and he, he produced a tone and a musicianship which was so special. And it was never showy about him. It was always about the music. And if I may say so, Ben, I, see, I feel that, that you have an affinity with this. I think you have a connection. That's very kind. <laughs> well, that's, that's my humble opinion. Thank so you. So there you go. But that's the programme. Yes, do have a look. Thank you. And if I understand correctly, this was the penultimate no, the final concert. It was the very final, final concert he gave final at the Usher Hall in Edinburgh. With his signature. Yes. Incredible. August the 31st, 1957, and he was killed at six o'clock the following morning in Hatfield, on almost back home in London. Composers did write works in memory of him, uh, one of which, of course, you've mentioned already, was the Poulenc Elegy. Would you like to just um, tell us a little bit more about why Poulenc wrote it and who gave the first performance? Well, the Poulenc, to my knowledge, was premiered one year to the day after um, Dennis Brain died, so in 1958. And the, the first performance was given by Neil Sanders, uh, but Dennis Brain's second horn in the Philharmonia for about seven years. That's correct. So one can only begin to imagine what an emotional experience that must have been. The work itself is incredibly emotional. As we were discussing, it kind of manages to encapsulate an extraordinary feeling of anxiety and angst. And, and what the composer manages to do is contrast these extremely violent outbursts in the horn and piano, almost kind of military-like aggressive music, mm -hmm. with these moments of tranquil, ethereal beauty. And uh, I believe there's one passage towards the centre of the work, a, a really kind of dissonant chord after rather violent, impassioned music, which is supposed to signal um, or kind of personificate in some way Dennis Brain's crash, you know, ultimately. Yeah. And that, of course, in itself is remarkable, but then what follows is just the most kind of simple music. And, and these kind of connotations I find really remarkable in a work that is in memory of somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all about what could have been after, afterwards, yes. Yeah, I mean, for me, thinking about Dennis Brain, he's been my focus now for the last few months. And it's just ended up being an endless question of, of what is.
So Ben, before we listen to the last track on the album, let's just um, talk a little bit about the aspirations of this that you want from this album and also the availability of it to uh, potential buyers. Yeah, well, let's, let's talk business first. Yes. I mean, the album um, is available online um, at Three Worlds Records website and all social media platforms. It will also be available to stream. Um, but one of the most exciting things that we've done with this album is, is really connected to the new music aspect. It's my aspiration for my career to be heavily involved with commissioning new works mm. and not just for me to play, you know. I want, I want all young musicians, I want all young horn players to have exposure to new music. And so if somebody is to buy this album for however much it costs, as part of that, they get a free copy of Hugh's Lament um, sent to them. So it's hopefully should be a really accessible way for people to get in touch with new music. And it's my hope that we can take this model forward um, with other recordings. Fantastic. So Ben, we're coming to the final item on this album now. Uh, a very exciting work by Sir Peter Maxwell Davis. Um, so uh, can you explain to us what, uh, what the work is about and what it's written for? Absolutely. Well, again, a bit like the Alan Bush um, kind of coincidence that I found out it was premiered in the same concert as the Britain. I stumbled across this piece in my research called Fanfare Salute to Dennis Brain. And so actually the idea for the album came from finding out that this piece existed. Mm. Um, I couldn't not include it in a legacy Absolutely. <laughs> a tribute to, to Dennis Brain's legacy. Yeah. So the work is, is very short. It is literally a fanfare. It's six short movements framed at either end by a tonal fanfare. And in between um, there are short movements kind of slightly in the vein of some kind of Gregorian chant. At the end of Peter Maxwell Davis's life, he, he really experimented with chant melodies, having gone through a rather avant-garde um, phase earlier in his life. And this work was written to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Dennis Brain's death. Wow. Well, that's a fantastic tribute you're paying to the memory of Dennis Brain, uh, a, a fantastic horn player, a wonderful human being. And thank you very much indeed on behalf of all horn players and all music lovers around the world. Thank you, Ben. It's been a delight. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you.